that's my last one. So I am glad that today is Friday. <laughs> you, you kept the best one for last. Awesome. I know. I'm, I'm, I think Brian's probably going off because he, he, he didn't come prepared today. <laughs> there you go. I'm just, I thought this was the invisible hat. Okay. So we are up recording. My name is Matthias Delvig. I'm going to hold this session on PulpCon for our CLI design. And I will get a little bit of help from David later. Um, to start off, let me share a screen. So I believe you can all see this. Um, this is about uh, our CLI, which is main, named uh, Command Line Interface. It's a kind of user interface in my thinking. And the subtitle here is Why It Is Worth to Handcraft Commands. Um, so we will go over this quickly, and I hope we get some discussion later after a nice demo. Um, there is obviously a problem. And the question is, why do we even need a CLI? And I have uh, put up three answers here. Um, the availability of a CLI has been seen as a showstopper for adopting Pulp 3 over Pulp 2 or other software, maybe. Um, the REST API we provide is rather hard to use by hand. And well, in the end, people keep asking, where is the CLI? Where is the CLI? So. Maybe that's reason enough to deliver. Um, next question, why is it such a problem? I mean, if it were easy, we probably already had one. So I think uh, one important thing to uh, keep in mind is that the target audience is a sysadmin and not a developer. And the REST API provides good building blocks for doing stuff, but it is focused on atomic operations. And therefore, I think the CLI should build around workflows. And uh, one important thing, the CLI should be a user interface, the user being maybe an administrator at that point. But it should not be just another tool you need to script or program some thing around. Um, the, the question has been, can't we just generate this? And this is. Uh, going to the subtitle of this presentation. Um, as, the, as it says in the name, the REST API is an application programmable interface. So I think generating something from there will likely not get something that is a good user interface, because it's a programmable interface. Uh, one obvious thing is that the API cannot wait for tasks, because it's limited to whatever um, time out your HTTP requests have. But whenever we create something around that on the user side, like a CLI, we can wait for task. And another thing is the API cannot at least easily chain commands. And in the CLI, uh, again, you can. You can start a sync. You can wait it to finish. And you can immediately trigger the publish afterwards, as long as the shell you're starting the CLI in, it lives long enough. And the next point is the REST API is built around UUIDs, or well, we do whole um, URLs, but they involve UUIDs. And that's quite good for machines to read and to process, but not so nice for humans. And the last thing is a little more subtle, I think. The commands might have or might need assumptions about relationships between our models that are just not encoded in the generated API docs. For example, what is the natural key? What is the equivalent of a name for my specific resource? So let's get to the next point, which is the design here. On the one hand, we want a plugin structure because Pulp is a plugin, uh, is, is a plugin heavy software. So 
probably our CLI commands should have the same plugin uh, structure so that each of the plugin writers for content types or whatever plugin can provide the corresponding CLI commands here. Um, this uh, brings up an, um, uh, a, an interesting question. How can we distribute the CLI? And there are, I think, three options we maybe need to discuss later. Uh, we can have one separate repository. This is uh, what we do with the um, proof of concept at, at the moment, where we just put everything in one separate repository. The question here is, who needs to be able to merge stuff there? Do we want to invite all plugin writers to add code here? The next option is individual repositories for all plugins, which would mean we just double the number of repositories we already have, which I think is a nightmare to organize. And the last option I see is as a subdirectory in the corresponding plugin repositories, which means the CLI code is very close to the code that it's used to operate with. It has the same code owners, but uh, it would mean that we distribute two packages from one repository, which we try to avoid up until today. The next question about design is, how do we want to talk to the API? And there are two options I see. One is using the bindings we already generate. Uh, the problem here is they need to match the installed version of the pulp server. So with one installation of the CLI, it's hard to talk to different servers at the same time without keeping to reinstall all the packages. And I think the bindings as generated from the REST API specifications are rather unintuitive to use. Um, the other option, which uh, we can show later as part of our uh, proof of concept, is using the API docs as provided by the server on the fly. We parse them and we assume that the operation IDs are once unique and second preserved across versions of pulp. And with that, we hope that we can have one command that can talk to different versions of the pulp server, including different versions of plugins installed there. The problem here is uh, if there is an incompatibility between the CLI and the server, we don't get a conflict when trying to install any packages. So maybe we need to find a way to code around that or wait until there are actual problems to solve. And then we have a design question about how do we want our commands to look like? And the idea we came up with will look something like this. Uh, the program itself will be called pulp and we will need a a few parameters to uh, specify to which host we are talking to. They will maybe include username and password, or it will ask for a password then. And then we have core commands like status. And if we go to more details into the plugins, they the command will roughly follow the plugin structure. So in that case, that would be pulp as the command container, as the plugin repositories, as the kind of resource to work on, on, and then the last bit being the verb, what we want to do there. And another uh, example here is pulp dev remotes show name equals upstream 21. That would uh, correspond to look up that certain remote and show me what is there. Then it being a CLI, it would be very nice to have bash completion. I think there are facilities in Python click to do this. And overall, we decided to use a click to build the CLI because it's really rather intuitive to add commands there. 
yeah, the mission uh, we try to follow with our proof of concept is we want a framework that is easy for plugin writers to contribute their subcommands. The framework may at some point provide some kind of object relational model to abstract the pub resources away from the rest calls, from the bare rest calls at least. Um, we think the objects should be accessible via natural keys instead of uh, UUIDs. And natural keys, you can basically think of the name usually, but in case of repository versions, it's the repository name and the version number. Um, the framework should provide templates for common workflows so that plugin writers don't need to do too much copy and paste, just say, yeah, I have that workflow adjusted to this class. Waiting for tasks to finish should be absolutely built in the lowest level of the framework so that plugin writers never think about tasks at all. And I think it would be beneficial to at least share the expertise with uh, another project we have, which is called Pulp Squeezer for Ansible modules that do a very similar or that serve a very similar task. Yeah, that's my introduction here. Thank you for listening and keeping the questions for now. But before we do that, I want to uh, hand over to David. I think he has prepared a small presentation or, or demo. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to attempt to demo um, our POC so far. This is a live demo, so. Our prayers are with you. I hope cool. we made the proper sacrifices. Cool. All right, so we have a limited demo or, or uh, POC. It's up um, on the in the pull org on GitHub. I'm just going to go through some commands. Um, so the first command I'm going to start with is pulp status, and this just hits the status endpoint. And you can see the response there is the same response from the status endpoint. Uh, the next workflow I'm going to go through is syncing a file repo. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a remote. And then the next thing I'm going to do is create a repo, and I'm going to give it my remote. You'll notice I can just reference it by name. So I've created my repository. Um, now I can sync my repository. And again, I can just use the name. And the CLI actually waits for the task. Um, it pulls, and then it waits until it's done. Now, if I check my uh, versions for the repository, I can see that there are two um, versions here. Um, the second version uh, is the one it just created, where it um, synced down three files. I can also look at my task. Here you can see. Um, the lock, progress report, not uh, completed. Um, so that's syncing. The other workflow we have is artifact upload. So I'm just going to download the ISO and then upload it. And this will actually use the chunk upload API to chunk the upload. You know, actually create the artifact as well, you know, way on the task. Now I can just filter the artifacts by my SHA-256. I get back the artifact that I just uploaded. So that's basically it for the uh, POC. We only support uh, file the file plugin right now, but you can check it out. I mean, you just basically clone the repository, and then I think pip install it. Um, and then you can use pulp.
That is awesome. Yeah, that is really awesome. And thank you for all the work you put in there. Not only creating the demo. Yep. <laughs> Were there any questions? I could talk about some of the, I guess, obstacles I see ahead um, with the CLI. Uh, yeah, I have a question about an obstacle. Um, we have, um, most plugins just have one type of remote and one type of repository, but some um, uh, plugins have multiple types of each. And, has any thought been given to how that will be specified on the CLI in the yes. CLI? Um, this um, click allows you to chain those commands into even more specification. And at the point where you are, let's say, at pulp container repositories, you can add a dash dash type and then the type of the repository to use. And would there be a default one then? And or... well, at that point, it depends on the plugin writer. But for file, we have this. It doesn't make sense because we only have one type, but we have it for technology preview. And it is defaulting to the file repository there. Yeah. Cool. So I got a, a quick question for uh, David or Matthias. Whereas you were writing support for pulp file. How hard is it for the plugin author to add these commands? How much work was that for you? Right now, it's we, we have to find a way to dry up the code, I think. Right now, I guess you would just copy and paste the commands, but there might be some way where we can share commands across plugins or something like that. So that's one of the obstacles, actually, that I foresee, I think, is making it easy for plugin writers to get started. Yep. Yeah, but you wrote almost all the file integration, and I think it was very fast. Yeah, it did go fast. Um, but like some of the things like parameters or like filters on endpoints, those are going to be a pain to like I, I skipped those. I didn't really add those. Um, some of those things um, will just be time consuming, I feel like. But there might be a way to handle that. I don't know. And so then the other question I have is about the rendering of the output. Mm -hmm. Right now, I noticed that there is a JSON renderer that takes the JSON that we get uh, from the REST API and just you know prints it out as it is appropriate. Um, have any thought been given to what the rendering should look like beyond the JSON output? Because the JSON output will be useful in some cases, and that should definitely be an option uh, for users to have that. But I think um, users probably want something more readable. Um, at that point, I'm, it's almost the same answer as before. There is an option for how to format it, and it's set to JSON, and that's the only option at the moment. So internally, the uh, answer from the server is actually parsed into a structure and then Regenerated as JSON. Yep. Well, it's easy to, for example, uh, put it to YAML. It would be more complicated if you want something like a formatted table or something like that. But yeah. yes, there is a code structure to provide this, I think. Yeah. So there's also some plugins for table format. So I don't think it should be too hard, but I don't know. Yeah, I think it's uh, hard to decide what information is going into the table, not how yes, to print the exactly. table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because our, I mean, like any REST API, the results tend to be overwhelming because it's giving you all the information. Um, but what I'm hearing is that as a as a plugin author who wants to build support in for this, I'm not going to have to do the parsing you just described. There's an entity that I get back when that command runs, and so complicated or simple, I can decide what to what to do with the output. I'm, I don't have to go through and just say, well, I got JSON. That's all I can do is spit it back out at you. So that's cool. Yeah. 
is there support and I'm, maybe this is just continue down this road is there support for being able to limit the field output i know a lot of our api calls you can specify which fields you care about is that something we could support kind of out of the box with this we could do it we'd have to look at it i think and see how many but yeah it's one of the so this is something that david i think mentioned is that uh, we have all these query parameters that let you filter things and the fields is one of those parameters that yeah. uh, we just haven't explored yet. Cool. So one of the questions I have is not every um, object in pulp has a natural key or if they do have a natural key, it could be complicated. So mm -hmm. like artifacts don't have a natural key. That's maybe not such a big deal, but then like content, like we can't reference content maybe by name necessarily. So I'm not too sure what to do about that. That's an open question, I think. Um, when you say by name, uh, for example, like an RPM package. Uh, yeah. Well, the RPM package is not too bad because I guess you have the package name. And for the individual, you've got the Nevra. So it has a natural key. But if you're trying to look at the big C content, as opposed to the, the detailed entity that is a piece of content. Um, like even, even file content is not, like file name is not unique. It's file name and a checksum. So yep. you reference a file content. Yeah, multi-key natural keys are very common. And I think having the SHA-256 as the key for artifacts is OK. Yeah. Can you repeat that, please? But to reference artifacts using its SHA is OK, I think. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. I think um, we need, there's, 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 facilities for doing this, but we need to think about how to let how to present that to the user. You know, like Daniel just pointed out in the chat, for example, never is not sufficient because you might have the same RPM and multiple repos with different checksums and those are different RPMs, even though they have the same never. So there's some complicating factors here, but it feels like the machinery is available to solve them, even if we don't have an answer right this second. Yeah. Yeah. And so th this is only a problem when you want to perform some kind of action with uh, that content because, you know, like searching for it, you can definitely find it and you'll get a list of multiple, right? And it will show you the different checksums that they have. But whenever it's time to say, like, add this rep uh, RPM to a repository, then you have a problem. Yeah. However, if it's copy this RPM from this one repo to this other repo, then it's not as much of a problem. Yeah. Like in my demo, I actually wanted to take the artifact and add it to the repository, but I had no way to do that because I didn't know how to reference con file content. Yep. So it says actions on content that are a problem. Yeah. So in Pulp 2, uh, one of the limitations we had was that you could only copy content from one repository to another. You could never take an orphaned piece of content that's not part of any repository and add it to a repo. And I foresee a similar limitation with the CLI here. Like our REST API allows it, but with the CLI, it's just practically impossible, I feel like, with what we're discussing now. If, if we don't have a natural key of which to reference things by, I kind of think that the PK becomes its key, which is not a natural key, but... Um, God. Dennis, can you, I think, can you explain a little bit why you think I, so I've got a, I have a piece of content that has a backing artifact that I've removed from all my repos. 
and I want to add that content to a repo. And I feel like I'm missing something about why I wouldn't just, you know, I've got, why I wouldn't be able to find that content given what we've seen here. Um, the challenge is that if you don't, ha you would have to use its primary key, as Brian pointed out, to find it. If uh, you, with the example of an RPM, there are two of them with the same never but different checksums. You using the never is not enough to be specific enough to select that uh, RPM. Sure. And so you need to be able to uh, specify a criteria that's specific enough that's going to find that RPM. And as Brian pointed out, we, we could do that uh, by having the user specify the PK. And perhaps that's what we'll have to expose. Um, but I don't know that that's such a great user experience. Yeah, or on the other hand, we add the checksum to the key. Yeah. yeah. And I actually see that we can have both that so reference by natural key or by pk yeah i think that would even work yeah well, and you, you can look up the uh, you do have an option to look up the reference and filter it down until you find out the one you want and get you know even if it's an artificial uh well i mean they'll have a pk but if you wanted some artificial name that maybe meant something to the API. Yeah, I I agree that it's feasible, but um, I just want our users to have a great experience doing it. Um, and so it is complicated from a command line. And that's why I'm glad we have a talk scheduled yeah. after this talk about the UI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is so what I'm what I'm hearing is it's not that it's it's not possible, it's just figuring out a way to make it palatable is gonna take some thought and some clever design work. I'm, I'm yeah. on board with that. Yep, I exactly. And okay. that maybe that may be the kind of thing where you don't necessarily have to um, if that's a feature that's needed, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a very explicit take this uh, object with this PK and do this particular, you know, method to it, to put it to this location, you could have, just have a, you know, move orphan that does some deep magic underneath that just makes things easier for users. You don't want to do that for every, every thing, but, you know, for some of those weird cases. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, we can do more, co well, uh, Thomas's comment here that if you've got the more complex workflows are in some sense hidden, as in the plugin writer has written a do this complicated thing command, then that abstracts the user away from having to know the low level specifics. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, I guess one of my questions is with this style of API, uh, like the, the OC OpenShift is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, it gets to be pretty big once you start getting into, you know, show me all the objects, show me all the schemas, show me all the places they can live, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that's very API-centric, uh, you know, CRUD stuff, basically. Uh, is there a space for like a higher level uh, command line tool for um, can't say a good, can't, a good example doesn't come to mind at the moment, but um, you know, maybe moving a repo or reti retiring a repo or something. Uh, Seems like maybe there's, there's some space for uh, a higher level one. And part of that is what we were just talking about, you know, but that also kind of shifts the level of abstraction between the two things. Sometimes I like to see that as separate demands. Uh, 
you know, one where I'm being very explicit about what things are happening and one where I'm kind of like, just do the thing. Do fuck me, love me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Where you DNF mean, versus RPM. You, know. you mean commands where you specify some kind of key and as long as it's only one match, it's okay. Yeah, or maybe, you know, import this artifact, move it to a repo, publish it, yeah. and whatever. Yeah, that, that's... yeah, where a whole workflow occurs with just one command. Yeah, and that's... That's the whole goal here is to add, I think the CLI needs to be very prescriptive and it needs to have specific workflows that it supports because the goal is to reduce the number of interactions that a user has to have with the system um, and uh, just capture the most common workflows that are useful. Yeah, like the the upload command, like you don't have to deal with uploads, the chunks, or anything like that that you would normally have with the API. Like that's all abstracted away. The upload command I sh- showed. Like in some ways, I, I always like the idea of having one thing that's just super explicit, basically card stuff, and one thing which is the slightly more abstract ones. So that yeah, if I need to change this field on this orphaned thing, whatever, yeah. I, I can do it, even though, you know, there's certainly yeah. no reason for that to be, in, you know, the first option that come up. Uh, but then the kind of more day-to-day, higher-level, um, yeah, so what I'm thinking, one thing that's very expressive, one thing that's very high-level. Yeah. Like, what I'm picturing with the repository create command is that... Um, you can not you don't have to specify a remote but you could specify a url for that um command right away and you could specify like a relative path where you want it to be published so that that one command would not only create a repository but it would create a remote and it would create a distribution so that the second command that you would give would be just sync and whenever it syncs it, in that case, it already knows uh, where to sync it from and it knows where to distribute it. So it would create a publication also and it would update that distribution with the publication. And so with just two commands, you've created a mirror of some upstream repo and it's already available for your clients to consume. Yeah, which from a user standpoint makes a ton of sense. It gets a little weird in that you want how much of that logic do you want to only live in the client versus you know basically defining workflows and do you want to build on a server? I don't know because nobody wants to build a workflow engine. Well, some of the I think Adrian, kind of, some of the workflow will probably get built into the server because um, it is just so convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, some like the web UI can't call multiple endpoints without like possibly being interrupted by a closed browser. So I think some of the workflows have to be built into the uh, server. Yeah. And the same thing with the CLI, right? You mentioned, uh, I think Matthias mentioned this, that uh, as long as the terminal session is not, uh, you know, interrupted, it's going to continue doing things. But as soon as, if you're not using Tmux or Screen, you get disconnected from that machine. Uh, that your workflow ended if it's not being handled on the server side. Uh, yeah. so, or you're keeping some state on client side too. Yeah. yeah, I've got a couple of questions. But even mid connection. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Douglas. Um, so, with regards to running it in Screen and Tmux, that. I mean, that's not the only reason why you can have a severed connection. You can have an internet connection go down. You can have a PC crash, any number of things. I think it would be quite important for the server not to be left in an inconsistent state because someone's workstation got powered down because of a patch cycle that occurred that day. Um, but on on the assumptions that, that are going to be made, one of the problems that I hit with Pulp 2 
was writing. So most of the interaction with Pulp 2 is through our own CLI that we wrote um, to, to provision um, the repositories and, and create releases. And I wasn't able to use the Pulp admin command because one example was the publisher name was different to the assu assumed publisher name by the yep. CLI. <laughs> What will we do with Pulp 3 to try and facilitate that? Is there, is there anything that we can do to make sure anyone that's going to heavily leverage the API but then want to be able to use a CLI for certain convenience elements? Yeah, so I worked on Catello before Pulp, and Catello uses different name uh, conventions, so I ran into the same problem um, a lot. So I have two solutions. The first is not to use naming conventions to attach objects to each other. And the second is we build um, small commands alongside more complex workflow commands. So you can use either or. Yeah, the goal is to be able to execute all the basic commands for each resource um, with the CLI also, and not just the full workflows. And okay. I think that's well, where that I mean that that sounds great, but I would I would say the goal a little differently, or maybe it's just a different goal. Um, we want the CLI to be able to be paired with any other uh, custom tooling, um, and so when your custom tooling goes awry or you need that one last little bit, the CLI can be used to augment it. Yeah, yeah, which is, you know, that's a good example that seems to happen in everything in the real world. Yeah. And I want to come back to another thing you said. Um, I think it was Douglas. Um, the server should be in a consistent state after each REST command. So it may not be in the state you expect it to be, but it should. Uh, the CLI should just not be able to get the server in an inconsistent state by using the REST API or any other tool using the REST API. I think that's a completely different goal. Because the rest, each command to the REST API is atomic. So once it's submitted, it unless the server itself crashes, which is yeah. completely different. Exactly. Yeah. And if it triggers a task, then the, the task needs to keep this... Uh, atomicity or, or at least the consistency yeah. there. So one of the things to think about based on the, this, this conversation is these higher level workflow commands where at the CLI I'm issuing one line and it might devolve into 10 API calls is uh, think about how to record in the background of the CLI. I was given this thing to do. It's going to take this many steps and here's how far I've gotten so far so that when that machine goes down in at step five of the 10 and falls over, and then we reboot and then go back into the CLI, it'd be really cool if the user could see, you issued this command and it's not complete yet. So the server's in a, a consistent state, but then Matthias, as you say, it's not what I expect it to be. It'd be really nice to be able to say, okay, finish that job and have it do the rest of the commands. That sounds a bit more like what you accomplish with an Ansible workflow. Or even just stashing client side some state about what you're about to do and kind of more of a you know get rebay style where it's tracking some information about where you are. You can resume or abort or whatever. You don't have to keep it all in one process or one shell or whatever so how would I, I i got the sense um matthias from from your response was that you didn't think that that consistency would necessarily be appropriate for this cli if that were the case a, a, an obvious example that i can think of is syncing an rpm remote which can take an awful long time um, I mean, you could look at a day and a half, depending on your internet connection and the size of the remote. Um, if, if the expectation is you can sync it 
that will create a new publisher and the distributor will be updated to point to the new publisher. Um, how would you deal with that in the event that there was a crash on the box? You restart your, your workstation and you want to see what's happening with regards to that sync process. Would the CLI, would you expect the CLI to be able to reattach, see the state of that task so it's still running and then just start waiting? Or yeah. is there a... I think so. That's what we do in pop two right now. Um, and I think that we can e we would look to see what tasks there are associated with that uh, repository and um, try to figure out if there is, you know, that sync still running. There is a subtle difference between two and three, though, in that two, please correct me if I'm wrong, but when you do the sync that kicks off a publish and uh, or the effective publish and association with the distributor, that's all server side. So you submit one job, and all of those child tasks are driven off of the server, whereas in this instance, it's driven off of the workstation. Um, and all of those child tasks are initiated by the CLI on completion of a task. And You're so correct that is that. true. You're correct about that. Um, however, we are definitely planning to add the ability to chain all of that on the server side so that your initial command uh, will specify that it wants a publication created and it wants a distribution updated so that that whole workflow can be followed through one task. Okay. Not expecting a commitment, but what sort of timeline is for that? Is that a four or is that in the No, three? no, no, like very soon. Um, okay. I already have a story written to do this in pulp file. Um, and once we get the first implementation in pulp file, we're going to add that to the RPM plugin right after that. So I'm thinking probably within like pulp core three, eight, a uh, timeline, something like that. Yeah. Which we need it for the web UI, which we're working on. Yeah. I expect, uh, go ahead. I, would, I was going to say, so, um, the reattach use case is very interesting. Um, I, uh, I think it might be not great if we have the CLI try to guess, maybe that's the right word, what the user would prefer to do. That's what um, I said. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, and, and actually, so if the user says perform a sync, you, you make server-side calls to perform a sync. If the user wants to list tasks that are in the running state, then you show them those tasks. And possibly from that, you might have a reattach command or a um, show output monitor. or a mo monitor. Thank you. Yes, monitor. Um, that way we don't guess and users can do what they want. I think that would mean the CLI needs some state that was saved across a unscheduled reboot. Why is that? I mean, uh, you say the, the CLI starts one task, and once that's finished, it would start the next task, but then something goes wrong. No, no, no. I'm saying that. Uh, no, I'm that's saying. Scenario. Sorry? For the, re for the reattach. It's like uh, you start a task, and then once that task is finished, the CLI would start the next task, like sync publish or. No, I I'm, I'm saying. Like, don't think uh, the use case I'm talking about isn't the one where there are two tasks even involved. I'm saying uh, just imagine one task, the sync, that takes a really long time. And the user doesn't have screen running, or they forgot to run it, or they don't have a long running TTY. And so they control C it, but they know it's still running, and they come back an hour later, and they want to show it again. I think we so, already have that. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that it shows the state of the task. Yeah, and maybe that's all it needs to do. Perhaps that is all it needs to do, because I did see this task state earlier. Yeah. You, um, when we run the yeah. 
uh, with the current implementation, you wouldn't rerun the first command, but you would uh, it would output which task it started, and you could attach to that task with the pulp task command. And I think that would be better than what we did in pulp two, which was look for running tasks and then just reattach. Yeah, and in a case like that, like maybe I don't want to I want to deattach from that task, so it's going to take four hours. And just client side, I just sort of yeah, I have a session where I'm what I sort of just task, and when I come back to it, maybe I just say, presume, you know, show me which task I had, and it's like, yeah, task number one with this, and I go, okay, we see that task, or we, you know, monitor that task again and show me what its status is now. Not necessarily yeah, I having to keep track of the URL externally or whatever. Yeah, I, I think right now the reattach um, use case, all it will do is show you the task state. And so listing a task is no different. Perhaps um, if you monitoring would, I think, feel different if there was like progress bars. Um, okay. If it was showing you progress in an interactive, visually updating way, that would be meaningfully different than just showing the state of the task, which for now I actually think is really great and probably maybe all you need. The other stuff is just kind of pretty to look at. Yeah. I, th I like think you check if you're, every time your attention span reminds you to see if that task is finished, you get, you can hit some of the progress report stuff and see, okay, it's a little further along. Yeah, that would I be think nice. The only thing about the reattach was if if there is a sequence driven on the CLI, so prior to the changes in 3.8, if there isn't a sequence driven by the CLI, then I'm far less fussed. Um, if it's offloaded to the server and then the server deals with the, the consecutive execution of tasks, then all you need to do on the CLI is see the state of that initial task that you kicked off. And I'm assuming you would then see child tasks um, I'm, I'm far less concerned about a reattachment if, if it's not done that way. Yep. Yeah, and it's these use cases of, you know, the CLI or a UI that are driving us to make this change. Yeah. And that's, that's my big takeaway from this is that um, it, we can't rely on the client to chain calls together. Shouldn't. Shouldn't. Yes, we have to can, but we shouldn't. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm check here. It's uh, it's seven minutes till, and there's yeah. another interesting talk coming up. Yes, uh, the next talk is about the UI. Um, so yeah, let's uh, stop the recording here. Okay, and reconvene in seven minutes. Yes.